How many of you have heard of presuppositional apologetics? Have you heard that phrase before? Okay, this is a very useful tactic in defending the faith, but I want to give a big warning about this too, okay? There's a problem with this thing too, okay? Now, here's something very interesting is that um, I have some of my favorite um, debaters and uh, people who defend the Christian faith. I've heard them use this tactic before, presuppositional apologetics. My favorite uh, creationist who debunks evolution, this is his tactic and mentality. Uh, my favorite debater against atheism, he also uh, took a little bit of a gist of that one as well. Uh, a lot of people who are actually defending the faith, they started to use this tactic and it became very useful against evolutionists and atheists. But I also want to give a warning about this too. There's a problem with this tactic. Okay, first of all, let me explain about the usefulness of this tactic, and then we'll talk about the problems with this tactic, okay? So the usefulness of this tactic, presuppositional apologetics, meaning uh, presuppose. Before you come up with an argument, there's a presupposition behind it. Okay, so how you can deal with a person, with an atheist or an evolutionist, you notice how they always try to make you Christians give you the burden of proof, right? This one is very useful where you turn the tables on them and make them give you the burden of proof, okay? So then it's just you can tell in between the lines what people say. So then let's say, for example, that, okay, come on, you have to prove to me that there is a God. So what is your scientific evidence that you prove that there is a God? And what you do is that you critique that. You critique that as... Okay, uh, but even if I give a scientific evidence and proof, you're not going to believe it. They won't. And what you do is that you question their scientific evidence. Okay, so why scientific evidence to prove there is a God? Why not another way? Why does it have to be a scientific evidence? And then they're going to explain to you why. Probably because that it's something that can be naturally seen and observed and we can experiment and we can prove it. And then you, what you do is that you keep questioning them on that. Okay, so it's by what you see, huh? It's by what you test and observe, right? How do you know that's really dependable? You could be wrong on what you test and observe. Maybe you weren't really paying attention to the calculations and etc. Well, and then they'll probably say after that, well, that's the reason why that we do peer reviews and then we'll go through different people just to make sure and to uh, cross all the T's and make sure that we get everything right. And then what you do is you keep questioning that, questioning that. Now what happens is this, when you keep critiquing and questioning them on that, in the end, what they're going to have to admit is that where they're building up their argument and their thinking and their logic, the foundation of their own argument is based on pretty much worthlessness. Or, not just worthlessness, but chaos. You might say, how so, Pastor? The reason why is, how can you insist that this scientific argument, that you have to be using that when your brain, which is born out of primordial soup, is the basis to give that argument? That's what you do. So what you do is that you attack their foundation. How do you know that logic has substance for the argument if we're all born out of soup? So then that logic, that scientific argument, historical or whatever, all came from what? What's the beginning, the source? Primordial soup. It has not, not that much substance then. It's something that we conjure up in our mind then on what we believe to be rational and logical. We, but who is we? Where do we all come from? Primordial soup. If you give them a question concerning about morals, what's the foundation and the standard for their morals? Well, how do you know? Okay, so let's say for example, concerning about, we're talking about uh, questions concerning the Bible, why it's wrong. 
or even in science, why it's right and wrong, then you ask them, what does right mean? What does wrong mean? How do you know that that definition for right and wrong is right, so to speak? Where did that come from? See, what you do is you keep nitpicking them on where it comes from. And when you keep nitpicking them on where it comes from, their definition of why it's rationalized or why it makes sense or why it's scientific, it all came from worthlessness, primordial soup, without substance, or from there is no uh, absolute standard for right and wrong. It's from nothing, confusion. It's all from confusion. That's why evolution, uh, they teach about Big Bang, right? All comes from explosion, accident, confusion, chaos. That's the source and the foundation of all their arguments. So when you keep picking them on that, then they start to question their own definition of evidence and logic and argument. Because it all came from what? Worthlessness and chaos. See, it has no firm substance. But this is why Christian argument is very useful. Because we assume right here that all logic and argument and foundation is from, not from worthlessness and chaos, but something all powerful. See that? So call it a God or whatever you want. But see, it doesn't change the fact that it came from something that has substance, absolute, and power as a standard. See, that's why, that's why presuppositional apologetics, a lot of Christians love using it because it seems more biblical. It's like a matter-of-fact statement that the Bible says this. Well, how do you know that what the Bible says is right? And then they might question your belief. But then, you know, uh, the, the tactic a lot of Christians use after that is they try to use historical evidence, scientific evidence, philosophical evidences, and all that. But what good is historical, philosophical, scientific if it was all came from worthlessness to begin with and confusion and chaos? But if you start out with just simply the beginning, the Bible says this. And this has substance, absolute perfection. See, that's why they like to use presuppositional apologetics, because it sounds more Christian. Because we can simply say the Bible says this, the Bible says that, the Bible says this, God said this, Jesus said this, rather than, well, if you look from a historical standpoint, mathematical standpoint, let's compare all, let's weigh all the evidences and logic and arguments. See, um, those things are called classical apologetics. And a lot of presuppositional apologetics guys, they criticize that because they're saying right there, you know, then you're just at the playing field of the world. And God, when he argues about his truth, he doesn't play on their field, they insist. See, God just says that as a natural, as a matter of fact, the heavens declare the glory of God, the firm and show it his handiwork. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And they know not the wisdom that is in God, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. See, so that's why Christians who are in presuppositional apologetics, they'll criticize when Christians start to resort to, you know, there are the, like, we know two laws of thermodynamics that prove the existence of God, or we know all the mathematical equations, calculations. Uh, when we study all from a non-biased scientific empirical standpoint, blah, 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 blah. A lot of Christian, uh, some Christian debaters criticize that. They say that the, God never resorted to that tactic. It's just me. It starts out with me, what I say. That matters. Which can be very useful, see? Now, the problem is this, though, okay? The problem with this is that when they resort to this tactic, sure, we can start out with God. Sure, we can start out with the Bible. But basically, it doesn't change the fact that it starts out with something supernatural, we call it. Now, why is that a problem, Pastor? Because you can't just simply say God and Bible, because how do you not know it's the Muslim God or the Muslim Bible? How do you not know it's the Mormon God and the Mormon Bible? See? So we can say God and Bible as a starting point, but if you want to be more honest, what this translates to is some kind of absolute, all-powerful substance. That's why we can use that argument against the atheists and the evolutionists. We have to start with something absolute, powerful, strong, and has substance. But that doesn't prove that, that it's only Christian, see? 
Because it, we can put the Muslim God there, or the Mormon God here, or the, uh, the Catholic and the, some theosophist kind of God, etc. So that's the, that's the flaw that they got to think about. Here's another thing right here. This is the problem with these people. This is why I, I have a little bit of a disdain toward presuppositional apologetics. You know where this was born from? Calvinist. Calvinists, they're, into, they're, they're known to be philosophers as well and scholars. That's why they can come up with clever arguments. So isn't presuppositional apologetics kind of clever? It is, because you're making the atheists, the evolutions, have the burden of proof. Because all you have to do is ask them why they think that scientific evidence, historical evidence, something like that, is truth, so to speak. And then you question the meaning of truth, you question the meaning of historical evidence, scientific evidence. And when you keep critiquing, it all comes down to this, these two as the beginning, no matter what. Our presupposition and beginning comes to this no matter what. That's why Calvinists like this argument. But this is a problem by Calvinists because they automatically assume it's God and Bible. No, that's not the case. You can include some other kind of absolute substance and power in there. You can do that. So then it's a matter of picking and choosing how do we know which absolute power is right or wrong. That's what it's going to have to come down to later on. But anyway, aside from that, Calvinists, they're philosophers, they're scholars. And why this is dangerous is this. Because they believe it starts with God and the Bible, some apologists, when they defend the faith and they argue for their faith, and then some atheist says, well, then how can I believe? You know, How can I get saved? Because he, the atheist is dismantled now. He realizes, well, then there is no truth. There is no God. How can I believe what you're saying about God and the Bible? That Calvinist is thinking because it starts with God and Bible, God has to do some kind of awakening within their spirit to make them understand that, which is what we fully deny right here. Calvinists, see, they think that some kind, some kind of magic touch is going to happen where the atheist is going to feel some kind of warm feeling in the heart and say, oh, okay, I believe there is a God now. I believe in the Bible. That's not how it works. How about you guys? Did, is that how it worked for you? Or did you have to do research and then think and then come to that conclusion a little later on? I mean, come on, be honest, man. But this is, that's why Calvin, this is dangerous because they can't, I've seen these guys, one of them uh, is Cy Ten, and I forgot his last name, Cy Ten Bruggenbog or something like that. Bruggen but Gay. what's that? I think it's Bruggengate. Yeah, Bruggengate. Okay, so you know him. Yeah, so this guy, he had a documentary about this one, but he's hard Calvinist. He's able to dismantle the atheist, and when he completely dismantles them, at the end, they're like, okay, what do I do? And then Cy's like, there's nothing you can do. All you can do is that God's going to show you something, you know, and then God's going to awaken you, enlighten you, show you, because they're Calvinists. They don't believe in free will, that you have to do something about it, but that rather God or God and the Bible is supposed to do something within you. That's why I don't like this. That's why I don't like this. So you've got to watch out for this. Now, one of them, uh, one of my favorite debaters against atheism, I like how he stood. He was more honest. He uses presuppositional apologetics too, but that's not his source. He's, uh, he's more for classical apologetics. So that's another branch right here. So there are three branches of apologetics, probably more than that. But the main one is classical apologetics. So in other words, it's kind of like you know, what your pastor does at times when he argues for his faith. He's going to use logic, you know, philosophy, history, math. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, rational reason, et cetera, et cetera. That's like classical apologetics. But anyway, aside from that, this man who is for classical apologetics and he sometimes uses presuppositional apologetics, he mentioned this. He mentioned that, you know, the, the problem with this thing is, is that, yeah, I do believe God's going to have to do something to open your eyes. But that doesn't mean that God, but that doesn't mean that God does not use Logic, history, math, science as his tools to use to open the person's eyes. Don't we do that when we do soul winning? What do we do? We pray for God to open the person's eyes and then we try to argue from a rational point where that person can somehow open his eyes. See that? Is that our kind of God? Yeah, look at Isaiah chapter 1. You got to realize that our God is that kind of a God. He's for a reason. Look at verse 18. 
Come now and let us what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Look, God's asking you to use your head here. He's not like, yeah, well, I'm going to warm your heart and make you see it. And you're going to go, oh, I saw the light after that. No, it's not. God wants you to do something about it. Come now, let us reason. Together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. God uses logic and reason to open up a person's eyes. You might say, well, I don't believe it. Well, did you read Acts chapter 17? Did Paul quote a verse of scripture to the philo Grecian philosophers? Or did he quote their sayings? He used a their, one of their Grecian philosophers' quotes to witness them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those Grecian philosophers, a lot of them, you know what they were? Agnostics. Because it said, to the unknown God. And you know what the Bible said at the end? The Bible said at the end that there were some of them who converted and got saved. Majority laughed, but some of them converted and got saved. What about Solomon? The Bible says he was wiser than any man on the earth. Do you think that uh, he didn't know history, math, science, and all that? No, he knew all of that. Wisdom far beyond any human reasoning. That's why the humans and kings and royalties, they were amazed by his wisdom. That who gave him? God gave him. Amen. See? God does use logic, philosophy, history, science, and math, and all that to prove his creation, his working, and his truth. He does use that. Another thing is Jesus Christ. What? Jesus? Yeah. What did, did you ever see Jesus whenever he argued with the religious leaders? Didn't he, like, uh, outwit them? He used logic to outwit them. This is so genius. This is my favorite story from Jesus. I always get excited when I talk about this. There were the Herodians. They were, po they were the politicians, the politics. And then you got the Pharisees who are all for religion. And they, wanted, they trapped Jesus with a money question. They said, is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or no? If Jesus said, no, it's not lawful to give tribute to Caesar, the Herodians who are for politics say, oh, so you're teaching about rebellion against the government. You're like Alex Jones, Ken Hoven, and all that. You're just like that bunch. <laughs> and unfortunately, those, two, uh, those guys can be dumb enough to fall for something like that. All right? They're not wise like our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And then you got the, uh, and then if Jesus said, yes, it's lawful to give tribute to Caesar, then the Pharisees can get on him. Oh, so then all those sacrifices that Caesar did, you know, and killing a lot of people, and in his pagan days that he did, using your own tax money, you know, that is just, uh, that is just wicked. How can you go against God? So then you got all these pastors who bow down like a slave to the government system, and then they want to get tied more and more with the government. So then what does Jesus do? <laughs> it's so brilliant, okay? He just says, give me a penny. Yeah. Okay, they're, they're all like wondering, okay, here's a penny. What's he going to do? Pull up, a, uh, turn it into bread like he did with his miracles. What's he going to do? <laughs> and he just lifts up a coin, and he asks them a simple question. Whose image and superscription is this? They said, Caesar's. And Jesus said, render the things unto Caesar that belong unto Caesar's. Thus, he doesn't get in trouble for tax evasion. And then he says, and render the things unto God the things that are God, so he doesn't get in trouble by the religious leaders. You know what the Bible says? They went away astonished and could not answer him. <laughs> Where'd <he go? laughs> Jesus Christ did not say, well, God said, and the Bible said. At that point, he didn't. A lot of times he did. He refuted with scripture, but at that one, he didn't because he was very clever. The Bible says that Luke chapter, uh, the Bible says that the book of Luke, Jesus Christ, when he grew up, in what? Wisdom. And found favor with God and who? Man. See, Jesus Christ had to use a lot of the things, logic, reason, all that kind of stuff, to prove how wise he was. Besides, why would Jesus Christ tell us to learn at the book of Luke? I forgot which chapter, but didn't Jesus Christ talk about the parable about the unjust steward, how he was wise and he was able to get away with it. And Jesus Christ said, why can't the believers be as smart as the, and learn something from lost people and use that kind of wisdom to benefit their own lives? See, 
So the thing is, that's the uh, problem with presuppositional apologetics. So what can you use this for? What I can use this for is to put the burden of proof on the atheist and evolutionist. And that's what you're going to notice in most Calvinist articles. It's atheist and evolutionist. But what are you going to do when you come across a Muslim, Mormon, and all that? So this one can be used for an atheist and an evolutionist, okay? You give them the burden of proof and make them see that at the end, it's just these two at the end. They have no absolute, no substance for their arguments. Their arguments came from nothing, no substance, chaos. Ours, we have absolute substance. Okay, then when it comes to here, then you're going to have to use logic and the history and then weigh the evidences from there on which absolute standard makes the most sense. And it's Christianity, God and the Bible. The Quran is a joke. The Book of Mormon is a joke. All those other gods are a joke because there is no other evidence that backs up God and the Christian God and the Bible more than anything else. All right, so that's what you can resort to. And please, when you use presuppositional apologetics, I'm going to fire you in soul winning if you're about to lead a soul to salvation and say, I can't tell you anything more after that. God has to awaken your heart and show you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to fire you in soul winning when you could have gotten that soul saved. All right, That's why I don't like this. I, I really don't like this. Here's a warning. When people talk about presuppositional apologetics, they have a Calvinist friend. So keep an eye out for that. They have a Calvinist friend. All right, You know what? I'll name names. Ray Comfort, Jason Lyle, and maybe William Craig, maybe. But these guys uh, who I really look up to in debating... I know they have Calvinist influences and friends. You know why? Because this came from these guys. Birds of a feather flock together. Keep the right company.